Your Excellencies, uh, Ambassadors, uh, dear friends, um, this is the 22nd session of the coffees of the Secretary General, and today we have the privilege of uh, having uh, Fernando uh, Reimers, who is the Director of the Global Education Innovation Initiative. He um, heads the International Education Policy Program at Harvard. He's a Ford Foundation professor of the practice of international education. He's a pioneer in education systems, and uh, he's working uh, on uh, this, now has become almost a, a, a cliche, the question of the global citizenship, you know, which is good because it means you have mainstreamed a, a concept which looked a little uh, alien or new, and now it's, you know, now it's part of the, uh, at least part of the speak, as they say. Um, he'll be talking to us about educating citizens in uncertain times. We'll have um, a uh, Q&A after that, but, um, uh, and by the time, we, by the way, we, we may, we, we, and when I say we here, well, my wife and myself will not be able to, maybe will not be able to stay until the end because we have to go to the Institut de France, mm -hmm. to uh, l'Académie des de sciences morales et politiques, mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, to, to uh, make a presentation on behalf of the OECD. But uh, um, I just would like to say uh, about, you know, besides my formal presentation, um, the world was recently confronted with uh, a rather complex uh, conjuncture, which is this question of the, um, the well, what is now known as a travel ban uh, in the United States, which uh, detonated all sorts of uh, reactions. Uh, but uh, Fernando Reimers uh, wrote an article uh, on uh, the Huffington Post called Can American Universities Protect Democracy? The President's executive order that uh, severely restricts immigration from Muslim nations impedes the work of higher education. So from the point of view of universities, um, he uh, raised his voice and put this out. It was quite effective because among other, um, other, among other things, it kind of detonated a, a whole wave of reactions by people as well in your own university, the dean, uh, but also in many other universities. Uh, interestingly enough, not too many out of the 4,500 universities, uh, about 40, uh, but quite distinguished, by the way, all the Ivy Leagues and all the big universities uh, raised their voice against it. Uh, again, for, for a number of reasons, but most of them basically talking about the values, talking about the role of universities in the world, the modern university, etc. So uh, I, I, I also I recommended to you the Huffington Post on the 6th of uh, February. But um, so we're talking about somebody who is not only a very distinguished uh, academic and somebody who's a scholar, but also somebody that uh, is a thought leader uh, and uh, and somebody with um, with guts huh? so welcome we're delighted we're honored to have you here you have the floor thank you so much uh, secretary Gurria, and thank you all very much for um, your presence this afternoon uh, my goal is for us to have a dialogue about what it would mean to educate citizens in a world in which the political philosophy of liberalism, which has oriented much of the work of governments and of global institutions created after World War II, is increasingly challenged by nationalist populist movements. So the to set the stage for our conversation, I'm gonna make a brief presentation. The, the idea that all people should be educated is relatively recent in the history of humanity. It is primarily a product of the Enlightenment and as such, a product of liberal political thought. As part of the ideology of liberalism, public education's goals were to promote freedom and equality, and they were primarily to educate citizens for a liberal political order. By liberalism, of course, I'm referring to the political philosophy founded by John Locke, 
that gave preeminence to the ideas of liberty and equality and which is the foundation of the freedoms in which democratic societies are founded. Freedom of speech, of press, of religion, free markets, civil rights, democracy, secular governments, gender equality, and international cooperation. It is these ideas that are being challenged by the rise of populist nationalist movements. Now, globally, access to public education expanded significantly with the consolidation of nation states and the expansion of liberalism in the 1800s and again after World War II as a result of the creation of a global architecture to promote the values of freedom and equality, liberal ideas around the world. These are figures generated by this uh, August organization. Um, they show access to basic education by population around the world and by region. You've got to think about lagged effects, obviously, and you see how there is, I mean, it's remarkable that 200 years ago, less than one in five people uh, completed a basic education, and now most people do. To me, this is one of the most significant silent revolutions that humanity has achieved. Um, you see that slope accelerate a little bit in the 1950s and 60s. You can see it's a very similar story in all continents, although the point of inflection is different in different regions, a little bit later in East Asia, South and Southeast Asia, Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Essentially, humanity, the face of humanity, change as a result of the idea that everyone uh, should be educated. So globally, access to public education expanded significantly with the consolidation of nation states and the expansion of liberalism in the 1800s and again after World War II. Under liberalism, it was assumed that public education could serve democratic political and economic goals with limited trade-offs between them. Additional goals, such as advancing human rights and modernization, were also seen as convergent with political and economic goals. And for these reasons, most governments advancing education as part of liberalism saw limited trade-offs between the various goals of education. Now, the challenges to liberalism from communism and fascism brought alternative goals for public education, challenging the notion that individuals could be free to choose which education to pursue and emphasizing political and economic goals and downplaying human rights and modernization goals. The tensions between the Soviet bloc and the liberal world caused some challenges to global institutions with respect to their education work. And that may be the reason why the tacit education consensus of many of these institutions for a long time was more about getting children in schools than about what they should learn in school or how what they should learn should align with the vision of a good life and a good society. Consensus on these topics is difficult to reach in international institutions and also in societies in which there is much political contestation. That may be the reason why the PISA studies so far have focused on domains such as literacy, mathematics, and science, and not on domains like civics or global citizenship. And it is also perhaps the reason multilateral and bilateral banks have seldom addressed questions of curriculum content, and the reason organizations like UNESCO have found it difficult to advance human rights education around the world, even though they were created to do precisely this. In contrast, nations with limited political competition, such as Singapore or China, have been able to develop coherent and ambitious visions for how the goals of education system should be aligned with the goals of economic and political development, and have been able to align several key components of their education system, such as teacher selection, preparation, and support with those visions. Whereas countries like the United States or Mexico, where there is more political competition, have found it difficult to reach consensus on a vision of what education should prepare students to do and how it should prepare them to live in ways that enable a vision of a good society. The undergirding rationale of such consensus was that there were limited trade-offs between alternative education purposes, that the same skills that help people become productive also help them engage as citizens, that advancing human rights was also advancing freedoms. The underlying assumption was that economic, political, social, and cultural development converged, that policies that foster economic development resulted in the development of cultural values that were supportive of development, and that these foster more social inclusion and political development, and that there were multiple reinforcing loops connecting the many facets of development. It was also assumed that globalization would be mutually reinforcing with these processes, mm -hmm. and it was expected that globally, the world would be moving towards convergence in an ever-going cycle towards greater freedom, equality, and happiness. 
But there is no convergence. Economically, there are resilient uh, inequalities and groups that are left behind, and there are important cultural divides with respect to globalization within nations. So given those difficulties, the next best thing left uh, for governments to do uh, is to focus on particular competencies as their goals without attempting an integrated view of what the sum of these competencies produces. Most countries focus on the basic literacies of language, mathematics, and science. Increasingly, the competencies under consideration are expanding not only to other cognitive domains, but to social and emotional domains. Governments and educators now are also interested in character, self-regulation, self-awareness, greed, tolerance, or leadership. But for the most part, those interests are not framed as part of a discussion of how the integration of those capacities in individuals will enable them to individually or collectively advance social or economic goals. This is a difficult conversation to have in settings where there is no consensus among elites on which place their country should occupy in a global economy. In spite of these challenges to developing clear and coherent visions on the purposes of public education, the dominance of liberalism as the organizing principle of the post-war order, particularly given the support of countries with large economies also committed to liberalism, fueled a set of education purposes more or less aligned with the ideals of freedom and equality. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the acceleration of globalization in the last several decades made these education aims of liberalism the dominant consensus of most of the world. And the Delors report, which many of you know, is a very good example of this consensus. It was a report, I think it is no accident, the same person who played a leading role in the creation of the European community would translate those cosmopolitan ambi ambitions to a vision of what education should be. And it's an ambitious and very capacious um, vision. So, as I mentioned, uh, there is no convergence uh, around the world. And so, this notion that there were limited trade-offs and so on worked for a while. Now, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the main political challenge to these liberal views came from populism. Populism posits that ordinary people are exploited by elites and challenges the notion of representative democracy with a presumed alternative of direct action by the masses. Since direct action by large numbers is impractical, too often populism results in autocratic rule by a leader communicating directly with the masses, think Mussolini. Unobstructed from intermediary institutions and from the normal division of power and checks and balances of democratic government. Some recent populist leaders include Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Fujimori in Peru, and more recently Donald Trump in the United States. Historically, some political scientists have argued that populism can, on occasion, give rise to fascism. Modern populists are exploiting the following ideas. The first, that globalization and liberal policies do not benefit all, and there are important groups of the population who are left behind and without hope of seeing their conditions improve. They attribute this to elites that are not accountable to those groups and to a model of development that fails to envision a role for those groups which are left behind. Populists also exploit cultural divides among the population, deep differences in values and worldviews. In the recent presidential election in the United States, these divisions are between the political establishment, which advanced views of the Hamiltonians and the Wilsonians developed after World War II, with the older views of the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians, the Hamiltonians advanced the idea of the United States played a global leadership role in creating a global liberal order to contain the Soviet Union and advance U.S. interests. The Wilsonians also advanced a global liberal order in terms of values that would reduce global conflict and violence. They promoted human rights, democratic governance, and the rule of law. The Jeffersonians believed that minimizing the global role of the United States would reduce costs and risks. And Jacksonian populist nationalists, in contrast, focus on advancing equality and dignity of American citizens and the linking from cosmopolitan enlightenment ideals and the global liberal order. So we're witnessing serious challenges to the liberal world order, mostly from populist nationalist movements. And they come in the form of challenges to the ideas of freedom, equality, human rights as a universal project, challenges to the ideas of representative democracy, and challenges to globalization. Now, what will this mean to education? 
More power to local groups to define the goals of education and less role for government and for intergovernmental institutions. Replacing global and national politics with local politics, of course, doesn't mean more consensus. It may mean more conflict, perhaps with less rules of arbitration. The divisions between cosmopolitans and populists exist also in local communities. One question is, how are these differences going to be resolved? Will the rule of law and expertise continue to play a role? We should expect less trust in public education institutions, resulting in general from less trust in governments, in experts and in elites. It's also possible that we will see a renewed emphasis on identity politics and cultural wars in education. But then the question is, can we manage some of the risks that emerge from this? There are some risks that we can expect to emerge from this state of affairs. The first is a risk to the very idea of human rights. If nationalism is the new organizing force, the notion of in-group and out-group is now defined not by membership in the same species, but by nationality. Because one of the consequences of globalization has been migration, non-citizens will be the first targets for exclusion. If cultural wars define the politics of education, we should expect to see battles over the rights of cultural and ethnic minorities. A second risk concerns global challenges. The prospects for collective action diminish as the world moves towards national populism, and the goals of education move away from preparing students to understand global interconnectedness, interconnectedness and globalization. A third risk, of course, is a breakdown of the institutions that were created to protect freedom, democracy, the rule of law, public education, the basic freedoms. This is the risk, however small, that populism might evolve into fascism. And then the risk, finally, is disorder. As a result of lack of trust in institutions, in elites, and in governments, this will make the challenge of resolving conflicts greater. So what can the institutions, one question is, can the institutions which were created to advance a liberal world order, such as this one, or the UN system, save it? I think that any individual or any institution interested in a global liberal order should consider a new focus on education for democratic citizenship, which includes global citizenship. This means supporting educators so that schools can actually advance human rights, educate about shared global challenges, educate for engaged citizenship, focus on dispositions and values as much as skills. and attend to the conditions that make it possible for schools to be effective in achieving these goals. Now, a new focus on education, on, the, on education and democratic citizenship and global citizenship could mean, I'm going to share with you information collected by the World Value Surveys, which simply highlights that the world may be moving in a direction that is the opposite of a direction that advances some of these uh, basic liberal ideas. These are data from the World Values Survey, which, as you know, is an exercise uh, anchored at the University of Michigan, which collects data from re representative samples of the adult populations in over 100 countries and has been doing that for over seven decades. And so one of the basic questions of this survey is, to what, what do you think are important attributes that should be cultivated in young people? And these are data from the last administration of the survey. This is just the selection of countries when adults respond that tolerance and respect for other people is one of the preconditions right, of um, any kind of liberal society, respect for those who are different, toleration for those who are different. The good news is that in the countries that you see here, most of the population sees that as an important quality that should be cultivated in young children, but not everybody. So in Australia, which is one of the countries with the highest uh, value for toleration, 85% of the population thinks it's a good thing, which means that 15% don't see that as a value. The United States, another country where most people think this is a good attribute, that's 70%, but one in three persons do not see that as a value, and so on. Now, in the administration prior to the last one, the percentage of people who saw that as a value was much greater. So there is something happening in terms of change in those societies, which even though materially the conditions of life in those societies have developed, culturally they seem to be going backwards. So look for example at, this is about 10, 10 to 15 years ago, 
how in China it used to be 70% of the population who saw tolerance as a value, whereas now it is 50%. In South Korea, it used to be 65%, whereas now it is 40%. In Singapore, it used to be 70%, it is now 50%. And then in the United States, it used to be 80%, 80%. it is now 70%. Um, from the same survey, that survey asks people a very basic question. Would you trust someone who has a different religious faith? So again, one of the basic premises of a liberal order is that religion shouldn't matter, that you should not decide who do you affiliate or who you trust based on um, what deity they, uh, they pray to. And again, what you see is that in most countries, the number of people who would trust completely someone of a different faith is very, very small anywhere. And if you extend the definition from, I know, I know you have to go, no, from, no, from, no, trusting, no, from trusting completely to trusting somewhat, that extends, but it's still not everybody, right? So it's 70% of the population in the US would trust somewhat, someone of a different faith, which is to say that 30% would not. Now, same is true for nationality complicated in a country in which we're all moving about much more because of globalization. And this is a version of a question. It's a way of asking people politely, are you a religious bigot? Uh, people are asked, to what extent do you agree with the statement that the only acceptable religion is yours? And what you see is that, again, the percentage of self-professed religious bigots is small, but non-trivial. In the US, it's 10% of the population. But if you extend the definition to those who not only strongly agree with the statement, uh, but to those who agree, that is 20% in the US. Now, 20% is one in five. As we know from uh, the last breakdown of a major democracy in Germany during the Weimar Republic, organized minorities can hijack the democratic process and impose their rules on everybody else. And so we should all worry about people who are extremely bigoted in their views, whether they are religious or otherwise. So some of what we see, um, the, the BBC and a private organization conduct a survey, mostly in OECD countries, about 15 OECD countries, in which people are asked, to what extent do you consider yourself a global citizen? They've been conducting that survey for the last decade and a half. And what you see is that the percentage of people who see themselves as global citizens is increasing in all the countries. But you also see that the populations are completely divided. This is true in the UK. This is true in the United States. It is true in Italy. You have about half of the population who are cosmopolitans, who identify with the notion that we're all part of the same humanity. And you have about half of the population that doesn't see themselves in that way. And the challenge for modern democracies is they have to reconcile these two very different cultural views of the populations uh, within each country. To some extent, I think that those views of the non-cosmopolitans are the views that are behind the rise in populism of individuals who see themselves, who see their identities challenged and threatened by, uh, by global uh, li liberalism. So this is from a, a speech of... Um, the recently elected President Donald Trump uh, before he took office. Uh, he's not unique. Theresa May said some very similar things um, uh, several months ago. We're going to see more of these things, uh, reflecting not the views of these particular leaders, but the views that those leaders believe those who elected them expect them to have a return uh, inwards, a return to the local, um, and to some extent uh, disconnecting from others. So this is too long. Um, maybe not relevant. It's an anecdote. It's information from uh, a teacher who works in rural California, who's describing, who works in the area of global citizenship education, who's describing how that work is becoming harder to do because these very small percentage of the population who are extreme bigots feel emboldened and get organized to decide that in this case they should not teach Arabic studies in the school or the Arabic language. And these teachers feel that, it's th that this work is now contested and it is, it is dangerous. I expect that we're going to see more of these, um, of these battles being fought uh, in the schools. These are data from the Southern Poverty Law Center in the United States, an organization that uh, monitors hate groups and hate crimes. 
And their last report documents about a thousand uh, hate groups, a number that um, that has peaked, um, that basically represent the views of those extreme bigots who feel emboldened and who feel they have the right to involve to express their hatred uh, ideologies with some form of violence uh, against um, against other people, people whom they perceive to be to be different. So then, what would it mean for education to engage in developing citizenship? Let me uh, conclude sharing some findings the result of some work that I'm engaged in at the moment. So this work is a result of a collaborative uh, consortium of colleagues in a small number of countries, in, uh, in China, in India, in Singapore, in Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and the US. And we're trying to understand to what extent are public education systems providing opportunities to educate children holistically, by which we mean to help them develop uh, not only cognitively but also ethically, to help them develop the capacity to know themselves and manage themselves, but also to relate to others in ways that are respectful. And uh, we've done, on the research side, we do three kinds of things, research, uh, social dialogues, and then the development of instruments to help translate these ideas uh, into tools that can help educators implement practices that are aligned with a holistic education. Uh, on the research side, we've done two things. One was to produce the book that is a is a quick summary of what is known about what some of these competencies are, and then an analysis of the national curriculum standards in these countries, helping us understand to what extent uh, is it possible to develop children holistically without the existing standards. And the, the good news is that the goals of the curriculum have expanded in all the countries that we studied in a good direction, in a way that should make it possible to educate children uh, to embrace the values of the Enlightenment. So I, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time convincing governments. I mean, we'll see as populist nationalist regimes emerge whether they're going to renege on, on those standards. But it hasn't yet happened, to my knowledge. And so that is very good news. It means that there is a policy environment that is um, theoretically supportive of uh, providing educational opportunities for students that will prepare them to understand that, and how to live in a way that advances freedom and equality. The challenge then with this growth in standards is how do you prepare teachers to be able to teach in a way that reflects those values? And that is the topic of a second book that will be coming out uh, this year that looks at exemplary programs of in-service teacher preparation in the same countries that I have mentioned. And I just want to share with you some of the highlights of that work. Uh, I mean, the good news is that uh, the highlights are basically, first of all, that there are programs around the world that can teach at scale, that can support teachers, so that they implement education of the whole child, education that attends to character as well as to cognitive skills. These programs are rather different from the way most governments used to think about uh, in-service teacher training. The, the standard idea of in-service teacher training used to be these short courses where teachers are pulled outside their schools and they come to learn a rather limited, uh, narrow set of, say, pedagogical skill. None of these programs are of that sort. All of these programs engage uh, the entire school over a number of years and involve not only work at the school level, but involve some kind of an organization that has more capacity than the school an NGO, a district, or a university. And they involve networks of schools, not just a single school. Those programs, um, at the same time, help teachers develop rather specific technical skills. How do I teach mathematics on Monday morning? Along with a vision that is capacious, that inspires those teachers, that contains a narrative about uh, what does it mean to educate a person well, that helps these teachers imagine what a successful product looks like, not in the form of these uh, disembodied uh, sets of competencies, but in the form of an integrated view of what a graduate that can reflect good character and good competency looks like. And that vision provides direction for the enterprise for this multi-year work that involves uh, the participation in learning of everyone in the school. All these organizations use assessment, multiple forms of assessment, not just of outcomes, but a lot of assessments of processes which are used for, for the process of uh, formative improvement of these programs. All these organizations involve the creation of multiple learning communities in the schools. So basically, people are learning all the time and have incentives to experiment and to learn from the results of those experiments. 
those organizations involve also rethinking and redefining the traditional roles. What does it mean to be a principal and a teacher? Change the structures as well as the capacities of people to work in those structures. Um, I'd be happy in the Q&A to say more about some of, um, some of the characteristics of those programs. But basically, I wanted to end having started in a less than hopeful note, indicating that uh, there is a rise of populism that challenges many of the ideas in which this very organization was founded and in which many democratic governments were founded, um, I wanted to conclude suggesting that to me the implication is that rather than taking for granted the basic ethical framework that undergird the work of institutions like these, we should bring to the fore the conversation about what that ethical framework is. And we should make the business of development uh, to promote the development of a moral compass for people. No society can function without one, with clear ethics. It was difficult um, during the Cold War to engage too much in conversations on what that compass should be. And it was perhaps unnecessary over the last three decades to do that because there was an implicit uh, ethical framework that was assumed to be shared. But that framework is currently being challenged. And what I draw from that is that the solution is not to avoid the conversation, but to make that conversation about what does development be um, front and center. We're going to have to rethink some assumptions. The assumption that economic, social, political, and cultural development work in tandem and the world is moving toward convergence is not borne by the evidence, for example, collected by uh, the World Value Survey, uh, which shows that what we see is, yes, empowerment of populations in most countries at different rates, but we see parallel lines rather than convergence, which produce these divides uh, in terms of cultural values within the population. And I think that has important implications for education, for what educational institutions should do if they are going to try to close those divides in the population so that governance is possible and so that inclusive growth is possible in, in society. So maybe I should, uh, and then the, la the last question is, I mean the last suggestion is, that that means a lot more attention to the work of schools, not just in their goals, but particularly in their pedagogies. And the good news is that there are tons of very good examples of how this has been done around the world. And maybe what we should do is, is learn from those examples and try to bring uh, that knowledge to the conversation about what does it mean to educate uh, students, um, not just for the 21st century, but for a 21st century where human rights are gonna be rights uh, that everyone can have access to. So let me stop here and engage with you in a, in a discussion of these ideas. I attempted to provoke you. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, very plural, integral uh, uh, perception and, 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 and provocative as well. Uh, may I ask, uh, to kick off the, the q and I, I would like to ask Andreas to start uh, perhaps with a comment and perhaps a question, if I, if I may, Andreas, uh, and then we will take questions from from everyone. Yeah, Fernando, <coughs> a question from my side. I mean, if you, you, you know the OECD, you've been involved in our work, and wh where do you think the OECD as an organization could make the biggest difference in supporting, you know, not just governments, but educational development at the front line in this field? So I would distinguish between um, work that is important in the medium and long term where the OECD has and continues to do very important work. For example, the work that you have done placing the conversation of what are the competencies that matter on the cognitive side with PISA has been very valuable. I remember the world before PISA existed. I think the world is a better place because we have those metrics. The work that you have done in innovation, documenting innovative learning environments has been very helpful and continues to do that. I think that work that assumes a stable world and that assumes governments that want to work with the OECD and that assumes a world in which evidence matters and elite and expert institutions are respected um, is important and should continue uh, perhaps deepening some of that work. For example, I think that um, we have to look beyond knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look at ethics and dispositions mm -hmm. uh, given the world in which we are. This is very important. Uh, I can imagine the reasons why it has been challenging to do that in the past, but I think this task cannot be avoided any longer uh, in, in a world in which we are seeing uh, really conflicting views about who belongs, about who has rights uh, in, the in the society. But I also think that 
I, I raise it as a question whether the OECD has the capacity to have some mechanisms of rapid response to emerging, possibly emerging crisis. You know, what could be an emerging crisis? Well, certainly the refugees are an emerging crisis. Uh, the conditions in which the millions of refugees are living is a, is a humanitarian disaster. And the question is, can an organization like the OECD be a part of the solution, uh, respond in the short term to address that? Um, I think that this rise in populism is going to act, exacerbate uh, social tensions in countries as the question of who belongs uh, becomes central and as the contestation of who belongs becomes central. And so it, it is quite possible that particular groups of the population will be not only excluded but mistreated, that their basic human rights will be violated. And so then the question is, if the OECD um, had been around the time when the United States created internment camps for Japanese, would we have been able to do something to avert, to either prevent, contain, or repair that humanitarian crisis? Uh, I would like to think that institutions like these will have the capacity, but it is going to require a different kind of thinking because in some contexts, the challenge may be governments, and you're largely an intergovernmental organization, even though the business of democracy is a lot more complex mm -hmm. than governments. You have different branches of government, you have different levels of government, and then, of course, you have civil society as well. And so is it possible for this organization to diversify its work so that you engage with the full range of actors that make uh, democracy work and where some of these emerging um, challenges are going to be played out. It, I raise it as a question. I would hope that it would be possible for you to do that. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the work of the OECD in many ways has been like the work of a university. It's been a work about generating evidence and generating knowledge appealing to the rational mind mm -hmm. of governments, assuming that governments are rational actors that can be persuaded by facts, and if you can just speak truth to power, good things would happen. But we know we need to attend to the delivery chain of governments, that governments may be rational minds sometimes, but the body may or may not follow. And I think where, where the rubber hits the road is in translating these new aspirations of curriculum into change change pedagogies in the classroom. Um, I do not know whether the OECD has the mandate or the capacity to engage more directly in the work, for example, of rethinking what does effective teacher preparation mm. for whole child education means, which might mean going beyond governments, because it isn't just governments that do this work. I just gave an example of how it is largely NGOs, district governments, and universities that do that work. So. To answer your question, I think that on the long-term work for development that you do, you already do a lot of good things, and you might tweak them and broaden them. Um, you might, for example, um, help connect the dots between the work that happens in education, social protection, as we think about some of these issues of exclusion. Might you imagine a kind of work that helps define what does it mean to include people in vibrant cities? What is life in a city, knowing that most people are going to live in cities? Should we, um, should you connect what I imagine are the silos of any institution where the work of different entities can help develop a vision of what inclusive development looks like and think of your audience as leaders of cities, for example, or think of your audience as legislators or think of your audience as the members of the courts mm. in a society. And then there is this, uh, I, I perceive, need for rapid responses both in identifying and, and addressing crises, which I suspect has not been your traditional line of work, but um, I don't know who else would do it. Mm. Thank you, Fernando. Um, May I ask you to introduce yourself before uh, the question so that, that Fernando thinks, uh, knows where, where you work? Please. Dirk van Damme from EDU. Um, thank you, Fernando. Wonderful speech. Um, but it, I'm not really satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to uh, challenge you a little bit. I think the, the worst thing that we could do is to just stand firm behind what we perceive to be the liberal consensus, as you call it, 
and to take a kind of defensive mode of action. Um, I think I would like to draw the comparison between what happened in 2016 and what happened in 2008. In 2008, it was about financial economy. In 2016, it was about politics and culture. And uh, we should ask the same question that this organization asked after 2008, which is, why didn't we see it? Why didn't we see it coming? What's wrong with our glasses? What's wrong with our analytical framework? So for me, the the question still is how can we further improve our analytical concepts? Because maybe the idea of the liberal consensus is just an illusion. It's just a fiction that we thought was characterizing the modern world. I don't think it is. Um, for example, a lot of nationalism and populism comes from multi-layered identities of people. Uh, we have always seen identities of people in a kind of normative way as moving from the local to the global, as moving from the small to the big. Um, and that has not happened with, with a lot of people, even those people who we think are enlightened. Um, so I think we, we first have to really start asking really deep questions about our, all, our own worldviews and our own analytical concepts, and then see how we can improve our actions. Thank you. Um, I take your challenge. I, I think this um, shift is deeper than the shift of 2008. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a mistake to underestimate it and to think that it's just a little blip on the radar with individuals with particular characteristics being elected. I think we have to look at the electorate. and. Um, and I agree, we need to much better understand why are some people willing to trade freedom for security, essentially, uh, which is what we're seeing. To some extent, we shouldn't be all that surprising because looking at the data from the World Value Survey would have told us that that's where a lot of the population around the world is and would have told us about these existing divides uh, within societies. Just even as people have, this is the, not the convergence, but the parallel lines of empowerment that are taking place. So what I, I, I agree with you that we need to rethink what development means and we need to rethink our work. I fully agree with you. And, I, and fundamentally what has become unhinged is the notion that development is an integrated thing and that cultural, economic, political, and social more or less reinforce each other. And um, we're going to have to do a lot of theoretical and empirical work to understand, well, why can we see economic development not accompanied by a corresponding change in values, for example, uh, from some segments of the population? The question of whether one gives up in liberal values is really a normative, not an empirical one. So i much rather live in a world committed to the idea of freedom and equality than the alternatives. Um, but I, I realize that not everybody feels that way. And, um, and, um, and at the moment, in some places, they are elect those who don't feel that way are electing leaders who feel they need to respond to individuals who who have I, my own reading of the situation is that it's not just a response to globalization and it's not just a response to um, poor economy. I mean, it would be easy to say, well, there are no jobs for people with few skills, so they feel excluded and therefore they need someone who take care of them. I think there is a, an element of this which is identity. What is threatened for some people is their very sense of who they are and who, what their identity is. You, know, you think about it, Take the United States, for example. Uh, it's a country where part of the process of democratic development has basically expanded continuously the notion of, of who belongs and authorized a conversation for a number of different ethnic groups except for whites. And so I can see how this would be unsettling. Um, when it, about half of the population has a hyphenated identity and half may wonder, and so where am I in this contract? Who am I? And so, so yes, I think we need to rethink that, but I would hope we rethink it 
in terms of how do we construct a world where liberal values, by which I mean uh, not the Washington Consensus, but the values of John Locke, uh, still have a hope. I mean, one possible scenario, right? If one looks at a very long view, I began my presentation saying this invention of schools happened yesterday. In our six million collective history of humanity, we invented these institutions yesterday. We invented democracy yesterday. It's quite possible that five centuries from now, if there is anyone still around, they will look back and they will say, well, those were some nice ideas that emerged in the 1800, and uh, they lasted for two centuries, but it was a very impractical utopia. The truth is that uh, societies are much easily managed if you have autocrats that tell people what to do and they take care of them. I hope that's not where we end up. I hope that there will be people around 500 years from now, and, uh, and I hope that maybe these ideas will last a little longer than two centuries, but we're going to have to rethink how do we make that possible? Because clearly, um, we need to be paying attention to other components of the process of development. And to me, that's why I think we have to address the development of ethics. No one is born with a code of ethics. People need to engage uh, in conversations, in reflection. They need to have experiences that help them think through what the consequences are of an order in which only tribes and the members of your tribe have rights and out members don't have any, uh, versus a world where you have universal rights. I think there is a way in which you can get people to prefer this world that uh, is based on the notion of basic equality. But it doesn't happen automatically. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Jeffrey Mill. I also work in education. So I have two questions for you. Um, the first is, you talk a lot here about global education, global values, global competencies, but how important is the word global here, and how do these things differ, actually, just from simple civics, morals, and ethics? Um, because you talk about these, like, tolerance, diversity is what you showed, and those are global values, but, I mean, in a lot of OECD countries, we already have lots of cultural, religious diversity, and that's already increasing, these phenomena. Um, and then, also related to that, I think that we here in this room live in a very particular world where everyone around us is from a different culture. And so the people we see every day are from are in this very internationalized, globalized context. But if I go back home and I think about my friends back home, I mean, they're very educated. Most of us are also like children of immigrants. So, you know, you can't really accuse us of being bigots, but they don't have friends from other countries. You know, your our lives back home are centered around our jobs, our families. It's not a very globalized context. So how relevant is this whole global word in particular? These are two good questions. I'm beginning to think that the term global is going to be a liability in some <laughs> settings. Um, and, uh, and to some extent, I mean, by global, I mean cosmopolitan. I think that, you know, democracy is a cosmopolitan project. I believe that the Enlightenment is a cosmopolitan project. This notion that you could build a world order in which every human being had basic rights and in which uh, you would try to balance freedom and justice. That is, I read that as a global project of humanity, just like I understand science to be a global project. Scientists who study whatever it is don't do that within the, within the boundaries of their nationalities. They're interested in advancing knowledge. I mean, it's no accident. To me, this global project actually precedes the Enlightenment. It happens when the Medicis bring into Florence uh, a bunch of people, artists and scientists, who create humanism and create the Italian Renaissance, and this is the fun and basically move us away from the Dark Ages and help us begin to question this very conservative order in which you basically birth was destiny, and you were stuck in whether you've been born a royal, which had a direct connection with uh, the gods or not, and so that process, which took several centuries. Um, is, in my view, a global process, but it may be a bad idea to call it that, just like it might be a bad thing to say universities are, in my view, some of the most global institutions, cosmopolitan institutions, but calling them so is a liability right now at a time in which there are so many in the population who do not trust expertise, who do not trust experts, who do not trust institutions like universities. Maybe the term global is bad. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by global. I mean two very simple things human rights, which is a great invention. It's, and it's a great invention that for most of the world has only been an aspiration since after World War II. And you 
remember the history. Um, you and I were not born then, but the history was very simple. The world witnessed the Holocaust and a tremendous and a horrific exercise of violence uh, of some people on others in the name of racial supremacy. And most people ask, how did we let that happen? How did we let that happen and not do anything about it? And one of the outcomes of that was saying, well, maybe we should define some basic rights that every person has, whether they are recognized in their legal frameworks or not, because laws can be changed as they were changed, as the, as the Weimar Republic broke down, uh, to put some people at the margins of the law and take their humanity away. But human rights were basically an insurance policy that we were building so we would never have a World War II. And these institutions were invented to help us maintain that insurance policy. That's why they were created. And so are human rights global? Yeah, I think they're global. Um, are they important? Yeah, I don't know how we have peace if we don't have some kind of a framework that gives us values. If you look at the people, if you look at the history of how they were done, it drew on many different intellectual traditions. It drew on many different religious traditions. And you can find echoes of those in many different cultural traditions. The second thing that I mean by global is the recognition that there are some, just like the advancement, advancement of knowledge should not know national boundaries is a universal enterprise, I think that there are other challenges and opportunities that we share as members of the same species that require collaboration across borders. And they have local ramifications. I mean, think about carbon footprint, right? It's not a problem that a single nation can solve or a city or a state can solve. And the way to solve it is not in conversations in these bodies, those matter. It's in helping ordinary people in the way in which they go about their lives, do their share, so that we actually don't bake ourselves in this planet. And there is very clear evidence that if we continue at these rates, we will bake ourselves and make some forms of life unsustainable on this planet. And so I think that how, educate, how we educate people is one of the ways to make sure that we understand the connection between our behavior and sustaining uh, the ecosphere. That's what I mean by global. But calling them global is probably a bad idea um, at this particular time. We should call them something else. But I don't, I don't think we should avoid talking about them because um, we have seen, I mean, violence, some of the worst forms of violence that humans have perpetrated on others begin when you begin to take the humanity of the, the other person away. And it's so easy to be tribal. It's so easy. In fact, I think we have to work hard at teaching us not to do that. Now, the other issue that you mentioned is the problem of the, of the eco chambers, which may come back to your question of how do we rethink institutions? Because the big discovery, certainly for me at this particular time in the United States, is how separate two parts of the country can be. Uh, it's like parallel universes, parallel universes where there is one universe that believes in evidence and another one that doesn't understand the same things by evidence. Um, it's complicated. It's complicated to have a representative democracy function when the factual base, uh, when the basic understanding of what the facts are is so divergent. And so to me, the implication, for example, for what universities should do is we have to engage a lot more with people who don't go to university and who have no hope of going to university. Uh, you know, we have a certain mission, but we should remember, by the way, the universities are, along with public education and democracy, also an invention of the Enlightenment, uh, invented by William Humboldt. And as you remember, universities were invented to do three simple things, to cultivate reason so people could think for themselves, to advance knowledge based on science, and to educate the public so that the public could hold, of course, the authoritarian Prussia state at bay. And my sense is that the mo this is the modern university, of course, is that modern universities have taken two of those functions and perfected them with a vengeance, education and research, but the extension function, most of them forgot about. Maybe because we didn't think we, I mean, the world was becoming more democratic, we had to worry too much about authoritarian states. But I think the, my reading of the problem of the echo chambers is that all universities should be doing a lot more extension 
and making sure that they are engaging not with the 1% or 1 per thousand who ever set foot in a university, but with everyone who doesn't set foot in them. And I could say the same thing for other institutions. I don't know what that means for global institutions. I think that these were institutions that were meant to help shape consensus among elites. And what does that mean in mostly political elites, governmental elites, but maybe also economic and cultural elites? And part of what has become unhinged is is this notion that elites should have as much power as they have. And I mean, that's the whole premise of populism, that people don't trust elites anymore. Ambassadors? <laughs> Spain first, and then UK first. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you very much, Fernando, for a very, well, a lot of food for thought and even food for action. But it's, uh, I don't know if food for action is uh, right thing, but uh, I mean, uh, in a way, what you are suggesting uh, has a lot to do with how, uh, in societal terms, the world is evolving. And there's a very, very old distinction made by a, a couple of British uh, political scientists, Butler and Stokes, in the late 50s, about how societies have both balance issues, I mean, issues on which the whole society agrees, and position issues, issues in which the society disagrees. And the, this moment is a moment in which balance is going down and position is going up. And this is the basis for polarization. This is the basis for mistrust in institutions. This is the basis also for this distinction between uh, the people and the elites, which obviously breeds very fundamentally populism. Well, how does the education system fits in it. This is a very, very, very serious issue, and really you, you quite rightly address the issue of, on the one hand, the cognitive uh, elements of the education process, basically knowledge, what the students learn, and competences, what they can do, what, what they learn, and the non-cognitive or metacognitive, uh, which are basically attitudes and values. And here, well, you, you, you refer to the, to the Jeffersonians the, the, and the Jacksonians, to put the two, the two extremes. So really, when, when the, the education system gets into the attitudes and values world, then you have the antinomy or the possible antinomy between be having a, a, a Jacksonian uh, teacher, or the other way around, more, more, more likely, a Jacksonian uh, family and, uh, and uh, uh, but not, not a Hamiltonian or Jeffersonian uh, teacher. So this, I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult to get an agreement uh, on this. So in a way, uh, I think that we should not uh, lose sight of the fact that also the cognitive dimensions add a lot to the non-cognitive. I mean, when a given uh, political operator in the UK say, we have had enough experts uh, in this country. What this is saying is a sign sort of a misplacement of knowledge, misplacement of evidence, misplacement. And, and I think that the cognitive uh, element of education do a lot for the non for the non cognitive. And it is difficult to get agreements and really to, 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 to get to a consensus on these uh, non-cognitive uh, dimensions. But I find it even more difficult to take it to a public system, I mean, in a, in a, in a, uh, a system level decisions, the more divided is the society. So um, I can understand and, 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 and buy that initiatives to really integrate those non-cognitive elements that trying to make good citizens. Uh, but I find it extremely difficult under the present circumstances to take it to the public system. Thank you. Steve, I completely agree. I mean, one of the things we have to make sure we teach young people is to think, and to think the way scientists do, and to have respect for evidence, and to work with others, and to understand truth as the result of a provisional consensus that is continuously being reshaped as we, as we learn more and so on. And clearly, there's a lot of work to be done in getting to that point. 
I mean, living in a post-factual world is very, very dangerous. In a world where a leader can change reality and can deny reality. But I'm not convinced that through scientific reasoning we get to ethical reasoning. I think those are separate notions. I mean, the reality, you know, accepting the idea that people are fundamentally equal, that's a normative proposition. I think it's a, for my values, it's a better proposition than others, and I understand that there may be some who would question that. I think we can have that conversation and try to work out what would the implications be of, of one set of ideas versus the other. I agree with you that it is very difficult uh, in polarized societies to get that consensus. At the same time, if you look at the countries that are making um, more progress in education, let's take Singapore. At the core of their curriculum, I think I have a slide to show you here. At the core of their curriculum, here it is. Now, Singapore is an interesting story, right? Now, it's a, it's a country with limited political competition. I will grant you that. It's a country that had a fairly autocratic rule for a long time. I'll grant you that. Um, but it's a country that managed to go from being essentially a swamp 50 years ago, whose natural resource was malaria and mosquitoes, a country of largely illiterate people, to building a country with one of the lowest unemployment rates and highest rates of per capita income in the world and a very high functioning education system. And they have pivoted the goals of that system only four times in that 50 year history. The last pivot, produce this set of aspirations. And look at, look at what they look like. What you see at the center is not science, is not mathematics, is not passing the university entrance examination. All those things exist. What you see at the center is ethical values. Because their assumption, now this is a tiny country of four million people. Their assumption is if they don't address that, they may not survive. Now they remember that 40 years ago, the main ethnic and religious groups got along with each other so badly that they almost burned down the city. And the people who lived through that experience are still alive. And so they know where intolerance leads, and they said, we never want to get there. We need to teach everyone to value and appreciate and respect those who have different identities because it's better to be alive than to burn the city down, the city state down. Now, I think that there are times in the history of nations where crisis open an opportunity to do that. So a country that I think has taken similar goals very seriously is Colombia. Now it's taken Colombia five decades of a very long conflict. And as part of that, it is one of the few countries that to my knowledge makes citizenship education, has standards for citizenship that include information on sustainability and uh, building a civic culture in ways that most other countries, frankly, don't, uh, that the US doesn't, for example. Now you might say, do you need a five-decade civil war to recognize the importance of this thing? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I grant how very difficult it is to do this work. But uh, in, in times like the ones uh, in which we live, I think it's unavoidable to have these conversations. Because if you don't have the conversations in the schools, the conversations are going to happen elsewhere and they may not be very civil. The form of the conversations might be groups exercising violence on other groups. So the question is, if not the schools, what mechanisms do we have for people to work out who belongs and what rights do they have? Double-handed? Very briefly, I do totally agree with you in the case of Singapore. I have been there a couple of months ago and very familiar with this scheme, but exactly is the example of a society in which nothing of what we have been uh, describing this afternoon happens, because it's an extremely integrated, well-integrated society in which core values are core values for everybody. So there's no polarization, there's not that mistrust. There is a lot of trust among them and a lot of mistrust among foreign. So they're not really, in, in that sense, very global or very cosmopolitan, uh, to some extent, they are a bit parochial, no, no, not only that. So I think, of course, in countries where everybody shares core values, you can do that, but the problem is all over the place where those values are not shared. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much, and um, 
Thanks, Fernando, for what was a really rich and stimulating uh, talk and discussion. I just You said you were being challenging, so I'm just going to challenge back a little bit, and I'm going to pull it down to the perspective of the practitioner and think, well, what does this mean in concrete terms, what you're, what you're proposing if you're, if you're running a school, for example? And, of course, one of the challenges you have every time you ask a school to do more is that you have to consider what it might do less of at the same time. I think it was you know, Thomas Young, who was the last man who knew everything. Um, we can only teach a subset of knowledge and skills. And of course, at the moment, we're very focused on the fact that um, giving our students an opportunity to take an active part in an increasingly highly skilled uh, economy requires the imparting of ever more detailed and deep skills and knowledge. So um, I, I wonder how you would marry that challenge, you know, just at the time when the curriculum is getting more and more heavily loaded in the, in the space of STEM subjects, for example, you're talking about giving time to the discussion of, of ethics and values, and I can imagine how that might be received um, by some commentators in the UK. Um, secondly, um, I do agree that it's important to bring these cultural and um, ethical values to the fore, but I would question um, the implication that they're not there already. Um, certainly, in my experience, uh, the best place to learn the dispositions and values of society, self-awareness, relationship management, self-management, is often in the classroom, where you're negotiating a highly social space with your social peers who are assuming a degree of representation in the school, representative of your society. And, as, and a classroom that is well-managed, you would hope, could impart some of that awareness without the need to pull it out, perhaps slightly sterilise the discussion and, and, have it, and have it on its own. Secondly, um, you know, the centrality of literature and history in all of our curricula, I think, shows the fact that these things have always been there. And actually, you know, I would argue as an English literature graduate that you can learn as much about um, how to manage racism or anti-Semitism from Shakespeare as you can from a fairly dry discussion led by, led by a teacher. And then just to come back on the, maybe the Spanish ambassador's allusion, which I've heard many times in the last few months, that you know, the statement that we've had enough of experts is in some way um, you know, a, 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 a sort of erroneous one. You, you've talked a lot about the Enlightenment. Surely at the heart of the Enlightenment was the rejection of the unquestioning respect for authority and you know, faith. And, Really what we're talking about here is, I think he said this earlier, the inculcation of critical skills and empiricism. And you know, that is, again, something that's been central to our curricula for a long time. So I suppose I'm saying this stuff is already there to a large extent. Do we, do we risk actually making it slightly less digestible if we pull it out and, and try and have it on its own? Thank you for those good questions. Um, I think that this stuff is already there in some schools for some children. It's not there for all the children. And so on the first question, how do you risk not overcrowding the curriculum? I'm not proposing that we create a new subject, but I'm proposing that we organize schools differently, where you begin providing those who work in the school an opportunity to become very clear about what is the graduate they're trying to produce, the kinds of things that elite independent schools do already. They have an identity. They can tell you what a person from school X looks like and so on. It's not true for most public schools. Um, develop that clarity and then use that to audit everything that happens in the school and to create activities in ways that can help integrate learning of science and character. Let me give you two examples of what that looks like in practice. <laughs> So one of the organizations we have studied in this book on professional development is an organization that has been around for 25 years in the United States. Name is Expeditionary Learning. Expeditionary Learning was based in the philosophy of the same person who began the United World Colleges and who also began a school in Scotland, someone who had lived through World War II and had to leave Germany because he was, he was a Jew, and um, who believed that it was important to help people develop char character along with academic excellence. So what EL does is in everything that teachers do, it prepares teachers to do just that. How? Um, teaching a person that you only produce your best work. And producing your best work is a function of trying multiple times. That's character. That's a character trait. 
you're also developing that character trait in the context of writing essays in English or doing drawings in science or running experiments. And you also learn to do your best work receiving feedback from peers. So the, the, you can boil down the secret sauce of this program, which is quite good, to teaching kids to use rubrics that define what excellent work is and to inculcating in them that you don't, you're never satisfied with the first attempt at producing the work but you use that attempt to get honest feedback from others, and on that basis you improve, and you go back two, three, four, seven times. Now that has implications for how much you try to cover in the school. The emphasis is not to stuff the children with content, but is to give them the opportunity to achieve mastery of less things, because in achieving that mastery, you are not only learning some content and some cognitive skills, you're also learning some of the other skills we're talking about, what we would call character. I'll give you another similar example of what this looks like. Another program we're studying is a program to teach science to very poor kids in Chile. It's a program that was started by some of the most notable, some of the best scientists in that country who concluded that it is impossible to be a citizen in a democratic society if you can't think the way scientists do. Not just if you don't have access to scientific knowledge, if you can't think the way scientists do. So what it tries to teach children are not facts, is not content, it teaches them to do experiments. It teaches them to begin a problem and translate it into a researchable question and to engage in an experiment that teaches them how to generate evidence and analyze and interpret evidence to reach some conclusions. So now both of these experiments require reorganizing, obviously, the work of the school. And in both cases, th both of these are somewhat at odds with the existing accountability structures in both of those societies which to some extent put a premium on covering more as opposed to achieving depth in understanding on the parts of, of students. So that was one piece of your question. There was another interesting piece, but it escaped me. As I answered the first one, I forgot what it was. I think, I think you've probably addressed it to an extent. I suppose what I was asserting, certainly from a British perspective, is that it's already, already there. Differently. I don't think we would be seeing the rise of the populism that we're seeing if uh, the people who are voting were the product of the system you are describing and they had developed these capacities. I mean, to be, uh, to be in a world where the facts do not matter uh, is a big indictment on the functioning of the education systems that are serving large segments of the population. Thank you, Fernando. I think you, no, the right, sorry. <coughs> Hello, Fernando. Thanks for the uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, so my name is Michaela. I work in the education, and my uh, my question for you is: You were mentioning that um, there was um, convergence uh, in kind of economical, political, cultural, and societal terms expected, but it didn't happen, <coughs> and perhaps. One of the reasons for that is because recently, as we can see, there was a huge focus on economical outcomes in the society, and perhaps that was a trade-off with, with other societal outcomes, um, partly driven by incentives that we currently have in the society, which basically uh, produces, in a way, people and skill sets in order to go to the labor market and to uh, have a job and to be successful at a job, and, and that seems to be kind of a, a main incentive. Um, and so my question is, um, how can we accomplish this convergence in terms of where, where economical, political, cultural, and societal outcomes are in balance when currently these are the incentives that are driving our system? How can we change these incentives and who should do it or how, how, how it can be done? Convergence anymore. Um, so there are two ways in which historically we rethink development. One is some kind of a world shock, a war, a depression, those kinds of events cause people uh, to rethink the fundamentals about what the good life is and how do you organize it. And I, you know, there's always a possibility that we'll have one of those that'll cause us to rethink uh, development. But absent a world shock, well, I, I consider some of the elections that I was describing shocking to some extent. Um, and so absent that, 
I think we can look at the evidence, and, and we know that there is no con convergence. Uh, my reading is that important as preparing people for work and for productivity, all production uh, the, the is, is founded on some kind of a social contract. And where you don't have a social contract, it doesn't really matter very much whether you're preparing people for the skills to get job or not, right? I mean, to put it crudely, there are places in this world where a person will kill another person to steal a pair of shoes. And they'll just do it and not think twice about it. Um, I don't think a society where too many people make that choice is viable for very long. And so you have to teach people some basic values so that you would not take the life of another person because you want their shoes. And when a person gets to the point of taking, I think, the life of another person goes beyond whether they have some particular skills that help them get a job or not, right? So, um, so I think all, we have all kinds of good evidence around the world in terms of the dysfunctions of societies, in terms of the challenges of societies that should cause us to think about individuals beyond productive beings, between economic beings. Individuals have multiple important identities. And uh, if education is to help the person develop, the person develop, it should address a range of those identities and not only the skills that help a person get a job. I mean, particularly, as we know, the world of work is becoming less and less predictable as, uh, as machines are going to do more of the work that we used to do. So. To me, good education and good educators, as, as the ambassador from the UK mentioned, good schools already understand that, understand that there are no trade-offs. I imagine many of you in this room are the product of such schools. Your teachers didn't feel they have to choose between helping you develop character and develop skills. What we're talking about is the education system that is available to the majority of the population. I think that's where we have a challenge. And I do think that perhaps we have put in place, we have tried to improve education systems using a theory of improvement that was just a little bit too limited. That out of necessity, you think about the accountability reforms that we have created. Out of necessity, we said, well, let's focus on a few outcomes uh, because we're going to have to start somewhere. And that's fine for a while. But if you stay focused on a few outcomes for very long, and then those outcomes that you're focused on become the only outcomes, then you have a problem. I think to conclude, we have the ambassador of Greece, Mr. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this presentation. May I ask you two things on two subjects? The one I know least about uh, in order to learn, that has to do with the use of information technology as a device for making, making skills and making perhaps more than skills. Uh, in one of the papers, I'm not sure whether it's the Financial Times or The Guardian, they have extended essays on some topic. And this was one on, on two chaps who uh, developed some application, some soft stuff, uh, which is meant to teach children how to write game programs rather than use them. And uh, it, it just uh, gave me an idea that probably the world of play is the only word world of equality. Uh, now, uh, it sounds a little bit airy-fairy, I mean, all these teachers teaching children how to, how to make it possible to invent play. I mean, more than, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it struck me as something interesting. I mean, that might be revolutionary. Now, the second question is, uh, is uh, I feel very unhappy, and you don't make me any happier, actually. Uh, not because of your diagnosis, because I think it isn't adequate. Uh, and I'm more in, in, uh, in tune with our, our first uh, intervener. Uh, I think this is a profoundly declining situation, a de an age of decline. And there is a, a poet said that, you know, decline is when the part o overshadows the whole. Uh, 
Uh, now, it's just to give a poetic uh, angle to it, but uh, the fact that you separated so neatly the crisis of, uh, in the economy of 2008 and the crisis in political society now, well, what's the thing that finally brought Hitler in? It was a balanced budget. Hmm? And that did it. I mean, 2008, you're counting what is happening now, and there's more to it. And it's almost as long as the Great Depression, only we call it now the Great Recession. Now, I think the, 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 the differentia specifica of, of this particular decline uh, are in the language, as usual. Consensus is where people don't question fundamentals. Uh, and political correctness is the test of being in the consensus. Because if you were not politically correct, you would challenge fundamentals, and then it wouldn't be consensus, and then you spoil the game. So you have to be fake, knowledge knowingly, in order to be part of a whole. Otherwise, you will be yourself out of the silo. I mean, you have to, uh, in a way, pay a tribute to the silo in order to be admitted in and be part of the whole and be part of the dialectic of society and all that you said about it. So an age of decline. Now, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? Uh, what's the dominant freedom today? To use money. I mean, money is the freest thing ever. Uh, not violence. Violence is a bit expensive. You can't be violent all the time. But anybody with money, anybody who controls money, can do anything. And the proof is that some governments now are beginning to go Chinese and Japanese. They refuse to allow money to buy wealth-creating resources. And which are these governments? Well, lately it's France and, and uh, Germany. Hmm? Refusing the Chinese right to buy into France and Germany. Now, I, I think we, we are not in the beginning of touching that. Now, to, to cut the story short, uh, equality, I think, is, is a false part of the Trinity. It is so demonstrably vacuous. Uh, and what do you do with it? Well, you must refine it so as to make it true. Equality before the law, for example. I mean, there are levels of equality. Now, Locke would have been on the side of money rather than freedom <laughs> of speech, for example. I mean, all of the two. So there are trade-offs within that. But that's uh, acceptable. What you can uh, perhaps uh, strengthen is fraternité, which is the play. In a way, a half lie, which is brotherhood, which is not true, color, creed, this, that, and t'other, and so on. But still, that might work more powerfully in a deeper level than the fake uh, consensus of, uh, of settlement. Thank you. So I'll start from the first one, which is definitely easier uh, uh, than the second intervention. Yeah, I think teaching kids how to create, whether uh, computer programs or create anything, um, and, and to do that not just by themselves, but in teams, is, is part of the goal of empowerment, which should be the goal of education. The beauty of coding, of course, is that it requires, at least theoretically, less resources than a laboratory, for example, or something like that. It's, it could be quite accessible for kids to have the opportunity to create not just games, but virtual worlds and so on. So yeah, I, I think of it as as Latin, in that there are good things to be learned when one learns to uh, read Latin or to speak Latin or learning a foreign language, develops a whole set of capacities. And it I making makers, uh, creators out of students, is probably a good thing, uh, given the world in which they are going to be. They're going to have to create a lot of things. On, on the last one, on the Trinity and, and, and Brotherhood, I think you, you make me think uh, with your observations. Um, I think it was Locke who also put forth a notion that a social, the legitimacy of a social contract depends on whether people accept it. And if, if at some point, and that was revolutionary, there is no authority in the contract other than the authority that the, those ruled by it give it. 
And so the, the challenge with not accepting equality or, or some forms of equality it is, is that at some point people might say they've had enough and this contract doesn't work for them, as we're seeing. Um, and so that creates problems for, for governance, basically. And, uh, and I think the idea of equality is very important, which comes back to public education. Public education was a way in which states could deliver symbolically to people the notion of equality, the notion that you may not all be equal, but your children are going to be better off than you are. And we have built these institutions where they all belong, and they're all going to be more equal than the parents who went to the schools. Now we have schools that became very stratified, and in many places it's not evident that even where you have had a lot of mobility, education mobility, you still don't have um, a lot more equality. So I, I think that part of the dysfunctions that we see come from inequalities and from how visible those inequalities are now. I mean, it's all there on CNN, it's all there on television. And, um, and I think that makes the willingness of people to accept the social contract um, more challenging. So I don't know whether this is a stuff of revolutions or just of Jacksonian revolutions, but. We, we, we can do that after. Uh, <laughs> Later on, yes. Thank you, everyone, this, uh, to, to be here. Uh, I think we, we, we should give a, a, a big applause to our speaker. He was very engaging and encouraging today. And see you at the next edition of the Coffees of the Secretary General, I hope. I see many faces that I've seen several times here. Super interesting. Super.